Yate. Yate. So my name is uh, Pat McCabe, and I was also given the name Wiyakpa Najiwi, um, which uh, translates somewhat into English as Women Stand Shining. And I'm just really grateful to be here. I want to acknowledge the original peoples, the original caretakers of this land, the Osage Nation, the Shawnee Nation, the Miami Nation, the Cherokee Nation. Um, so thank you, relatives, for all of your deep love and care for this land and also to all the amazing, uh, passionate Kentuckians that I meet here uh, currently who also love this land, and so we share in that together. So um, I come from Dene Nation, so I'll introduce myself that way. Um, so I'm telling you about my clans, just in case we're related by clan here. Um, and uh, just uh, very honored to be here and very honored to be with um, my colleagues and, and, and fellow panelists here. So I, I really need to start out with a song. The song tells me what we need here. Um, so I, I, on my way, I'm trying to remember who it was that told me that the, the bald eagles are returning to this area, is my understanding. <laughs> And um, last year, you also were giving me the history of the Buffalo Trace. Um, so I'm going to start out with an eagle song, and then I'm going to move on to a buffalo song. <laughs> <clears throat> I needed them to come and be here with me. We need them. We need their wisdom. We need their understanding of how to be here now. So I'm going to begin with something that I often begin uh, with to kind of orient us in a new way. Because frankly, 
probably the vast majority of the people sitting in this room, you were not trained to hear me. You were not trained to see me. And not because of my own personal glory or fame, but I think you do need to see me, and I think you do need to hear me. So I, I often uh, start by talking about this way of orienting. Uh, there's a, a professor, Dr. Greg Cajete, that lives in New Mexico, and he wrote a book called Native Science. And in that book, he talks about how when he was studying the early anthropologists and how they saw indigenous people, um, he said they always used the words primitive and childlike to describe us, right? And, and uh, he said, I love him for this, he didn't say, what a bunch of racists, he said, there's a system of thought going on over there that makes it such that every time they see us, that's what comes to their mind. I wonder what it is. That's an elder, right? And, uh, and so he went to explore. Who are these people that are saying these things? Why do they see it that way? Maybe if I understood their culture, I would understand why they see us that way and why they say those things. So as he examined, you know, who were the authors of these books, these papers um, about us, and he realized that they were primarily English aristocratic men. So he said, all right, let me take a look at them in their culture. And in their culture, what he thought he was seeing, again, he's looking through his lens, so this is his best interpretation. Um, he said, okay, so up until the age of five in their culture, um, they get to sing and dance and play and pretend all they want. But at the age of five, it's time to get down to the serious business of being the educated man. And at that point, all these other things can become hobbies, but what begins to happen then is uh, the education is all about training and honing the intellect. And so from then on, that's the way. That is the way principal way of knowing anything. So when these men came over to this part of the world and they saw us, what did they see? Well, we were singing. We were dancing. We were talking to things that they didn't think you could talk to. We were seeing things that they didn't think you could see. And their only conclusion, based upon where they came from, was these must be very primitive people. These must be very childlike people. Even their grown men are engaged in the activities of children. Well, when Dr. Cajete wrote this and I read it, it changed everything for me. That was like one of the big turning points in my life because it made sense of this world to me. And I think it really makes sense of this dilemma we're in in, these, in this topic that we're studying all week here. You know, what it said to me was, for my own people, we engage in the song and the dance and the visioning from birth all the way till death. And so we never stopped that way. We don't have this point where we say, okay, that comes back here. No, we continue those things on. And what I'm going to say about that is the song is a way of knowing. Did you feel how everything changed in this room? Did you feel what happened in your body? The emotional rising, the soaring, the... So it's a way of perceiving reality in a very different way. And so I call it a way of knowing. And so what I'm gonna propose here, and this is true of what we call indigenous people, and I, somebody asked me last night, how do you define indigenous people? And I'm going to say, for our purposes right now, that an indigenous person is a person that is of place. And so what I, what I see is that, is that these people that we find all over the world who, I mean, part of the hallmark of indigenous people, right, is their song and their dance. And that's because that's a way of knowing. It's a way of knowing place. So one of the other things that I always say to orient us is to say, that if sustainability is the highest and most sought after technology on the planet, who should we be talking to? 
We should be talking to those peoples who've known how to live in one place over an extended period of time, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years, in relative health, harmony, and happiness. Those are the premier scientists of understanding how to be here. Now, these same people that continue these practices from birth to death, so I'm, I'm going to say that they have a broad spectrum of ways of knowing. Is it a coincidence that having this broad spectrum of ways of knowing and, and the fact that they have sustainability, is that a coincidence? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's been part of my scientific inquiry. And so I'm going to say that having a broad spectrum of ways of knowing is intimately and intricately connected to sustainability, right? So I feel like I need to say that first before I even begin to talk about inner being because if I just started out saying what I wanted to say about inner being, you would not understand where I am. So part of this uh, dilemma, as I see it, is that science, and I'm going to go out a little bit further, and many faiths, I'm even going to say, have, well, science for sure, um, has, is coming out of this intellectual place, right? And so when I look at material science, reductionist thought processes, that have really come to dominate our understanding of reality. They're coming from this intellectual place. And what, what, what the analogy that comes to mind for me is when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> and so I'm going to say when all you have is an intellect, everything looks like things to be categorized, problems to be solved. It puts us in a very narrow zone of perception. And I'm going to propose to us, and maybe any of you who've ever been in a relationship of any depth and passion, whether it's between your child and, and, or with your sister or brother or your, your lover, your, your, your husband or wife, um, you know, try going at that relationship with your intellect day after day. What happens? No. No, no. Y'all know, that, that, that's not a good way to go. <laughs> right? And so that's what, I, that's what I'm perceiving in this whole conversation, is that when all we have is this place right here to try to make sense of everything that is going on around us, we are missing a big part of this picture. So I, in, I want to describe interbeing, um, and interbeing is a great word. There are, very, there are very few English words that really describe indigenous concepts. They're completely different structures. In English, something is always doing something to something. <laughs> and in indigenous language, it's almost all verbs, which is actually closer to what scientists are discovering. Everything is in motion. Everything is energy. I'm not actually a solid thing standing here. I'm, my molecule is slowed down <laughs> and beyond, right? So, so what I want to say is that interbeing is a word that relates to, I, for, I don't think I said that I was also adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life, and those songs I was singing come from that tradition. And that's where I get my name, Weakpa Najimwi. But in, in the Lakota tradition, we talk about the sacred hoop of life. And what we say is, is that every form of life gets to have a place on this sacred hoop. And every form of life has a perfect design for thriving life. If we go outside, and we look beyond all the skyscrapers and everything out here, and we find that little patch of earth here and there, if we get down and look at it, what we're going to see is everything there is trying to figure out one thing, how to make more life, 
How do we make more life? The ants are saying, how do we make more life? The birds are saying, the trees, everything. So I'm going to say the plan in this place is life. That's the plan. That's the creation that we were set in. That's our place, our home. And so what I'm going to say is that every single member of this sacred hoop of life has a perfect design for thriving life. And every single member of this hoop of life has to uphold their part or the integrity of the hoop begins to fail. And I think that's where we're at at the moment. So as a human being, my question is always, how am I upholding my perfect design for thriving life? And for me, this is where our faiths can come in and tell us, you know? They, they, they have something to say about what that design looks like and what the enactment looks like, right? In my faith, I say that I need to be in harmony with all of the rest of the hoop. And actually, what we say is that human beings were the last to arrive here in this place. And that makes all of the other members, all of the other family members of that sacred hoop my elders. They know much more about how to be here than I do. So it kind of flips some, some belief systems on its head, I know. But, so that's how we hold it. So I'm always looking to my elders to say, how do we be here? That's why I called in that eagle medicine. That's why I called in that buffalo medicine. In particular, for this beautiful place of Louisville on the river here in Kentucky because they know something about being here. And the fact that the eagles are returning, good job, good job. <laughs> so I guess that's how I want to uh, talk about interbeing is, is I feel like at this point we are looking at, we're coming down to this question of asking, how do we, as the five-fingered ones, remember what our perfect design is for thriving life? And I really love that the words humility have been brought up because I think we could stand to find that place of humility at this point. So I think I'm going to stop there as laying a little bit of a, a roadmap for uh, future discussions. And I just really thank you for giving me your, your attention. And I also... Um, I just want to tell you that, that I've been told, and there'll be more time, I'm actually on several panels more this week, um, for those of you who are going to be here, that this question that we are working in is, a, is, is crucial for us, that we need to address it. They, they've called it an archetypal wounding of humanity. How we have been relating to our sciences in particular what sciences we've adopted, and how we implement what we believe we know from them. So we're right on topic, we're in the right place, we're in the right time, and I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for starting us in song. Thank you for interpreting for us that when song comes from you, it's calling in. Um, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about how we need to broaden our ways of knowing. And I experience you as, as a woman, as a human being, as an indigenous person who relates to, as you shared with us, multiple indigenous traditions and pathways, legacies, a, a Navajo Diné woman living at Taos Pueblo, also carrying the Lakota ways, and you walk boldly through this modern Western world as well. Can you share with the group just a little bit about how you navigate that bridging inside yourself to allow you to do that so skillfully out here in service? 
Um, well, when I, I was raised, uh, my father went to Stanford University and I was sent to East Coast boarding school. I attended Phillips Exeter Academy. Um, in those places, I was taught to, um, to try to, to be competitive. And so the goal is to see what someone else is doing and see if you can just up that game just a little bit more, right? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, that, that, that wasn't sitting in my heart and my body, right? I began to deteriorate. I, in fact, I came to a, a, a spiritual crisis, which is how I ended up being adopted into the Lakota spiritual pathway. And I know that there are many people in the world who are suffering in that way right now. And I know we have young people sitting here as, as well. Um, and, and so what ended up happening for me is, my, is, is I was met in a very visceral way by, um, by spirit. And that came through the Lakota spiritual uh, practices of the sweat lodge and, and other things, the songs, learning those songs. Um, and, and so what, what ended up happening was I ended up being a part of a community that was beyond human and beyond human ego. And to be met by the earth, to be met by the water, to be met and, and be called granddaughter in my, in my heart and mind by, these, by the water, by the trees, by the wind. Um, you know, it sort of took me out of that mindset. It took quite a long time to heal that. Um, but at this moment, you know, what I know is I love this mother earth so much, so much. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I can, you know, like so many people who are on fire in their faith, you know, come to this place of being complete devotion and complete service. So when I walk out here and I see you, you know, what I say to spirit is, you know, I'm going to do my best to give you a chance to speak to whoever is sitting here right now exactly what needs to be said. Mm -hmm. And so when it becomes not about me, mm -hmm. this is not about me, um, everything changes. And other, you know, I, I call on that larger community to have their input here, to give their voice here. And um, I was really grateful in that, in the earlier panel before we got to the questions, because um, I was like, wow, we're not even talking about this amazing uh, branch of the human family of indigenous knowledge in our solution finding. But it kind of came around to that right at the end. So I was like, all right. Because I, I do think it's critical. That, that's why, you know, it's not, I'm not here to be cultural show and tell, but, but that's why our indigenous cultures are so important for all of us, is this is the library of human understanding of how to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not indigenous knowledge or science. It is indigenous science. It is a science all its own. It's a meeting. We're at a, we're at a pathway meeting. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Gerardo, will you share some comments with our group from an entirely different perspective? And I wonder if there may be some overlap as well. May I ask some question? Yeah, sure. Exactly. Uh, now, you spoke rightly so that all of us, I think, uh, we are kind of, the, our knowing is right now confined to the intellect, right? In general. And of course, there is a, another type of knowledge that transcends the intellect. And you also referred to that. So how does it happen in your tradition that you can make that uh, switch, you know, from intellectual knowing into non-conceptual or kind of transcendent knowledge? Is it through song? I mean, I, I think I understood that when you sing, at the end of the singing itself brings you to that kind of transcendent or seemingly transcendent state, right? But how do you remain in that state? Is it something that stays more, stays long, or it is just an experience that then disappears, or how, how does it happen? Is the, is, is the aim in your tradition uh, of uh, like the inner being, or what our, you know, like what is our, our inner being? Is, is the aim in your tradition to recognize that inner being, and is that inner being a being that transcends the intellect and has a different sp type of cognizance or knowing? Yes, I would definitely say it has a different kind of cognizance and knowing. Um, uh, well, one, I guess the word that we use these days is uh, either embodied or, um, there's another word, uh, anyway. Kinesthetic. 
kinesthetic, yeah. Um, so, so that was the first big switch for me, um, was going into a sweat lodge and being literally with fire, water, earth, air, when you could get it. Uh, <laughs> um, and just to be able to pray with my whole body was such a new experience for me. Um, because in the tradition that I had first been brought into with my grandparents and parents being taken to the Dutch Christian Reform Missionary Residential Boarding School, so that's how I began. They, they, put, they, they, they were raising me in that way. And I felt like my whole body, like so much of me was not included in that, in that prayer. Um, and so that was one of the things that I, that I really appreciated was to, to have this embodied experience um, which automatically, I mean, when you're in the sweat lodge, you can't think. This has to quiet down. In fact, that's what I say when I, when I lead that ceremony, is I say, you know, it's going to be hot until your mind surrenders. But as soon as your mind surrenders, it's not going to be hot in here anymore. Um, because your mind is screaming like, well, what about this? And how about this? And what happens at this? And, you know, what if it gets, you know, all, it's like, you know, it's troubleshooting. <laughs> the mind loves to create problems to solve. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is a transcendent place. And I think in terms of, of maintaining that, it, it's, been a, it's been a process of letting go of that intellectual, intellectual way of, of being and also me-centered and, and how am I doing relative to other humans. Letting that fall away then allows for me to be on this earth in a new way. And the earth is here everywhere all the time, right? So, you know, let's not forget that underneath all this pavement, it's only about what, six inches, eight inches maybe? Um, and we got, what do we say, we got like a mile to the center of the earth or six miles, anyway, it's long, it's big. We're, we're on someplace big. And you know, when I hear uh, some of the elders say, you know, one heartbeat every 10,000 years and we're living in that reverberation. Mm. Um, you know, that's everywhere. It's right here in Louisville. So it's, it's about reorienting to Again, I'll call it the larger community of flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, and also the spiritual. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.